For the Ohio Farm Bureau, I'm Ty Higgins. Welcome to webinar number four in our series about farm labor. Over the past few months, we've been heavily focusing on how employees in agriculture can better attract, hire, and retain farm workers. In the past three webinars, we've covered recruitment strategies, keeping employees on the farm for the long term, and using H-2A to keep to get the job done when the local labor pool is a bit on the shallow side. Those webinars can be found right now online at ohiofarmbureau.org. For this particular webinar, we're going to talk about the importance of culture in agriculture, all part of a new collection of labor resources created by Ohio Farm Bureau and nationwide to help farmers position their business for success with a strong labor force. It includes more resources online at ohiofarmbureau.org, a labor intelligence report titled Farm Employees, Where Are They? Strategies and Solutions for Your Farm, and exclusively for Ohio Farm Bureau members, a guide to finding, hiring, and retaining farm employees. A couple of very special guests for this webinar on culture. Please welcome Mark Ruff from Ruff Farms in Pickaway County. Mark, great to see you. Tell us about the farm. Absolutely. Uh, Marsha and I started a first-generation farm or a modified first-generation farm about 25 years ago. Um, you know, we had both had agricultural backgrounds, but nobody was farming full-time when we decided to get married and, and start. So uh, it's kind of a modified first-generation farm, and we raised three children. One's at Ohio State, and two were at Westfall Schools, and uh, they're all involved in the farm as well. So we raised corn and soybeans and wheat. Also joining us for this podcast is Michael Hoffman. He is founder and owner of Igniting Performance Incorporated. Michael, great to see you again. For those who weren't able to join us for the first webinar, which you are a part of as well, tell us about Igniting Performance Incorporated. Hi, Ty. How you doing, Mark? Hey, listen, uh, it, it's really all about, it is about culture. That's why I love the topic. Our organization is, for the last 30 years, has worked with organizations across the country, internationally, on the topic of culture, and specifically on creating it and igniting it on purpose, the purposefulness of culture, because we spend most of our waking hours basically with each other, and that means we should put a little effort into creating that atmosphere that makes it go, I love working here. So uh, the last, uh, gosh, five years, I've been working specifically with the ag business around the country, and it's been it's been a blast. The, the farming industry is a very unique because it's so family oriented, and it's been a perfect fit. A couple of uh, very special experts joining us for this webinar, and if you have questions for them as we have this conversation, please feel free to drop those in the chat. We'll get to those here in just a little bit. Uh, Michael, I want to start with you uh, and talk about the importance of a strong farm employee culture. Why is it so important? It's everything. It's really everything. And you know what I what I find a lot is working out on the farms. I was just up in uh, Vermont just, uh, uh, about a week and a half ago, and and the amount of attention that goes into every single cow on this dairy farm. I mean, twenty six hundred head, and they know every single cow, everything about them. Every, when when one is sick, when one is healthy, when they're happy, we want them to be happy. And the amount of effort that goes into the animals is incredible, absolutely incredible. And it, it makes me ask, how much effort do we put into the people that work in the farm? Do we know every single person that works with us? What makes them happy? Are they well? You know, And it takes systems and processes to run a healthy dairy farm. It should take systems and processes to run a healthy human farm farm, a <laughs> culture, if you will, because those are the ones that get it done every day. So the importance of culture literally is everything. And, and to me, the culture is defined as what we tolerate and what we accept. It's that thing that makes it say, I love working here and I can put my fingers on the things that we say and do that just make me be the best I could possibly be while I'm here. That's what culture is. Mark, there are so many things that have to go right in order to a farm to in order for a farm to be successful, right? The weather, one thing for sure. Uh, markets, input prices, equipment uh, breakdowns. When you think about everything you have to think about as a farm owner, uh, how often do you think about culture? Daily, I, I've seen it rise and fall. I've seen organizations do well with it and do and do poorly without a good culture. So you know, I think it's important, and it's really a mindset about. Uh, and we're talking about employees now, about do you look at your employee staff as a necessary evil or really part of maybe your ministry or part of, you know, your purpose on life is to raise a good crop. But you know what? You're also raising people and you're also creating wealth in them as well. So as Michael mentioned, you know, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars maintaining combines and tractors and fields, et cetera. What are we doing to invest in our people? 
And that really drives what that culture is. Michael, how much has the the importance of culture changed just in the past four years? I think you know where I'm going with this. Uh, as, as the employee maybe got an upper hand in, in the way that uh, he or she looks and finds jobs, uh, how much uh, much more important is culture now than it was maybe five years ago? Oh, man. I, I, you know, I think it's always maintained its importance, you know, if you will. I don't think it's gotten any more important, but it sure has hit the spotlight, mainly because of retention. You know, if 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 when the when the pool gets smaller, it's more important for us to consider what what are we inviting people into? Because the more that people have choices, the more that they're being um, more critical in, in deciding where I'm going to be, the more important what it's like working here, what I'm going to be when I when I am when I when I work here. Am I going to grow here? Am I going to be a part of the tornado versus a victim of the tornado? Is this going to pull something out of me? Is, am I going to grow? That is that is more important now in the decision making process of not only coming on board, but staying on board than ever before. So I don't think it's ever lost its importance, but it sure has taken the spotlight. Mark Ruff, I have to ask, when it comes to building the foundation for your culture there on the farm, is it something that on day one you actually say out loud to your employees or is there a bulletin board on the wall that talks about your culture? Is it just them watching you and what you do that they kind of learn what your culture is? How do you go about conveying your culture to your employees on your farm? Well, I think in that introductory process in the interview, you know, I think it's probably best if my employees speak for our culture. So, you know, I ask them to spend time alone with the interviewee and like, you know, tell them, tell them, let them know what it's like to work here. You know, what are the benefits of those attributes? What are the pros, the cons, the negatives, the positives? And kind of get them to feel that a little bit because, you know, actions speak louder than words any day of the week. So, and then, you know, really once they're on board, in my opinion, it's really about how I act and how I react every single day to every single minute to every single situation and how I expect them to react as well. So, you know, it's how we treat people. And in some of that, you can only relay so well. You can only put up so much on a bulletin board. They kind of have to see it, feel it, experience it. But when we're when we're onboarding somebody or we're interviewing somebody, it's really about getting somebody who's experienced that culture is my best explainer or advocate about what we do and how we do it. And Michael, you, you think it's maybe uh, something you can't just say directly as a farm owner to an employee. Wouldn't it be more, uh, I guess, strong of a message if it came from another employee to talk about the culture of the farm? I, everything screams culture. Everything screams culture, but I really like what Mark said, and that is if there's an opportunity for them to see it, not necessarily from, you know, the, the management, but it's but you can tell you can tell. And, and I mean, just walking into a business, let alone a farm, I'll, I'll know pretty quick what it's like working here just from the attitude of the employees, you know, coming in and meeting people. What what is expected from everybody who works here? Uh, it's more caught than taught. It really is. However, I would not hesitate to verbalize. Everybody should verbalize. If management is saying what's expected here and the employees are saying what's expected here, I'm going to know that this is what reality is. And, I, and I'll find it um, easier and quicker to come on board when it's really clear what's expected of me, what it's like here, what we, what we, uh, what we accept and what we tolerate and what we don't accept and don't right. tolerate. So the easier you can make it for me, the better. Everybody should be screaming it. So, Michael, follow up to that. What are some of the common strategies that an employee, an employer can use to recruit and retain farm employees when it comes to culture? I'd be be obvious about it. You know, I love the fact that um, uh, that that people focus on skills. Everybody has a different skill set. A management team is specifically for managing people, not just the operations, but also the people. One of the biggest things I see in, in uh, problems with culture is management does not live what they want everybody else to live. So I love like, like farms like Mark, you can tell the farms that really is a great place to work because it starts from the top. There's an old saying that says the, the you know, the fish stinks from the head. <laughs> so that's, that's the leadership. You got to know it, you got to live it, and you got to champion it. And that means being clear of what expectations are and holding people accountable, that managing, that coaching aspect. Those are skill sets because I want the people on the farm to be not only just doing their job, working with the combines, being effective in the parlor, but also on how we work with each other. And, and then and then when it comes to creating culture, you're talking about creating um, anchors and creating traditions. 
in, in, in establishing those things that say this is what it's like working here. Those are some examples. Well, the reality is, though, Michael, that every once in a while, things aren't going to be rosy, right? Mm -hmm. So what if there is a disconnect between leadership and employees? I think that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, I that's where that's where everybody's watching, <laughs> you know, and they're they're saying, okay, you know, you are you going to deal with this or not? What what's expected from us? That's why I love the fact that when I I throw into the definition of culture, it's the things that we tolerate and the things that we don't tolerate. One of the one of the number one things it comes up in the top three every time we do surveys of organizations, not just in the ag world, but in all businesses. One of the biggest issues is management doesn't deal with the problem children. <laughs> you know, uh, and we, we tolerate we tolerate behavior that is that, you know what, um, why would we let that go? Why is not that being dealt with? But at the same time, and then in other words, coaching, pe pulling people aside and saying, let's talk about that. Get it on the table. We're not this is let me let's, let's go back to the standards. But at the same time, when things are going really well, it's not left in a vacuum. If if everybody, not just management, but if everybody learns to say when we're on and when we're off. You take away that fog, especially when things go awry, because they will. But that's when your skill sets will really be important. That's when your skill sets of communication show up. Mark, can you give us an example of maybe a challenging time and how you were able to overcome that with your employer, employee? Absolutely. So I would say um, I got distracted at the helm uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, maybe prior to that. And culture, in my opinion, had slipped. And honestly, I was feeling it. I wasn't happy with what I saw and what was happening. I was, and I realized the labor market we were in, and I let some things slide because finding that replacement individual or replacement individuals wasn't readily available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I had to kind of play that long game of, man, I have a crop in the field. I have a crop to get into the field or whatever. So there are certain things that I, Unfortunately, I have to close my eyes to a little bit. And even though I'm still coaching along the way, as Michael said, you know, there are a few things like, you know, if I can't fix it today, I have to play the long game of how I fix it over time. And there were a few individuals that we we walked out the door in a way they felt like they decided to leave, yet they're gone and our culture has improved. Uh, and we and they left in such a way that from time to time, if I need some a truck driver or somebody, I could bring them back temporarily. I wouldn't necessarily engage them with the rest of our of our employee staff, but hey, you can fill this role for me. You left on good terms with me. Was, you know, nothing critically wrong here, other than the fact that you weren't quite the right fit. But you know what? You can fulfill this role. We helped you get a CDL. Man, I'd like you to drive this weekend. Would you Would you help us out during harvest or something? So you know, I, I think that the key is, you know, figuring out when you can play the short game of I got to coach up or coach out in a hurry, or I have to tolerate and coach up or coach out and and find a way to separate on a very uh, amicable way. You know, Michael, I never thought about that. When you think about culture, you think about just it's set in stone, right? But there maybe has to be some flex either with the employer or the employee in this case. Actually, the flex is part of the culture. You know, I love what, Mark, I love what you said. You know, there are times when it's not the right fit. And I, I get this all the time. Managers go, well, when do I get to lower the hammer? And my biggest question is when when it's time. I, that, that's your position is to kind of judge what's going on. I loved how you said we got a short game. We got the long range. Is this a coachable moment? Is not. But if it's not a good fit, then it's not a good fit. And here's the deal. If I'm letting somebody go, it's because th there should be no surprises. It's not a surprise for them. It's not a surprise for me. We've covered as much as we can with the season that we're in. I also want to say that, you know, when those tornadoes rise and we step up and we have to hold people accountable, we're working long hours, you're doing things that you were never hired for because it's needed at this time. That's actually part of our culture where everybody shows up when it's needed. But it also should be part of the culture that you play hard, that you recognize, you know, effectively that you do those things afterwards when we, you know, require people to to step up. When times are challenging, we know how to re reinforce and reward and recognize. That's all and part of the culture is farming is a tornado, Jack. It is crazy. Lord knows what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And we expect you to be a part of this, not a victim of this. And that takes all, all of that as part of our culture. How we step up and face that is created over time, purposefully. Don't forget, you have questions uh, for either Mark or Michael. Drop them in the chat. We'll get to those in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Michael, where does continuous learning fit into the culture of an employer? 
It's a, a, everything. As a matter of fact, that you know, he said, "Is it? Is it? Uh, is it now important? Because uh, culture part of it. To me, one of the biggest issues about culture is: Do I have a place here? Am I growing here? So, because that continuous aspect has never not been, but the importance of it has kind of really caught people's attention. In other words, I'm growing here. Uh, the 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 farm I was out in Vermont was was absolutely wonderful. In where do you want to go next? Seeking their employees. Uh, information, their their goals, their wants, you know, when we do have a little bit of slow time, those conversations that happen as far as what skill sets are you needing to step into a position you'd like to take in the future? In other words, if, if this is something, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you, you find a, a home here and you want to be a part of it. Let's talk about where you're going and what skill sets you need to add to your bag in order for you to be successful at that. That's great proactive management, which is the culture I, I'm growing here, which is why um, Ohio Farm Bureau is tremendously important because the resources that are available is just one element that is at the disposal of every organization that's a part of this to, to give that information and to give that opportunity to grow with the people that are there. Um, Mark, you, you'll keep me longer, that's for sure. Mark, you mentioned that you know some people just don't fit. But there are some people that are just the cream of the crop, right? They rise to the top and, and you want them to be a part of your organization for a very long time. Right. How do you use continuous learning to keep them involved and keep them active and keep them growing? Yeah. So one of the, uh, it's not an interview question. One of the statements I make in an interview that if, if, if I hire you and in six months, you can't do or aren't doing things different than you are today. Don't have additional accreditation or licensure or something. I'm failing you and you're failing me. We're expected to grow. I mean, I'm expected to grow and they're expected to grow as well. And we we outline for them up front, hey, getting a CDL, getting your grain handler's license, getting an applicator's license. You know, those are things that are that are good. But even if it's not licensure based, it's the function that you've invested some uh, local extension seminar, or maybe you're flying them to Nashville or to another state for some, some different seminar or, or, or uh, conference, you know, Putting investment into them is probably one of the best returns on investment that I could possibly make. I see it when they come back, they come back with ideas, they come back recharged a little bit. They, they feel good about the fact that we put them up in a hotel and they got, got a little smarter, they got a little stronger and they're making us better in the process. So Marcia and I are both educators by our background. I'm, a, I'm an ag teacher, she's an elementary teacher and we are lifelong learners ourselves and we expect that out of them as well. Michael, employees uh, really see that effort, right? Then they appreciate that effort. It makes them want to do things to go above and beyond for their employers in the long run. Oh my gosh, yeah. Mark said ROI. That's a that that's exactly the point. I not only do I want you to be happy here, you know, we want a happy, healthy, strong farm, but it's also a wonderful investment in our group. Man, if we have an opportunity to to invest in our skill sets for everybody, everything starts to everything starts to rise. And and what you'll find is you'll find people taking ownership for things that you never anticipated them taking ownership for. And what I mean by ownership is when you know, the, the old expression, if you want to make three hundred dollars an hour, don't do thirty dollar an hour work. And it's not that $30 an hour work is below you. It's just that there are other people that could be, should be owning that so that you can do higher level things and you can do other things in the area. And that's the whole point of investing in your people. You'll find that they not only own their positions, but they'll also own where the farm is going as your needs grow, as your opportunities show up. You're going to have the people in place that are not only part of what's going on but they've been invested in and are willing to step up it's just a snowball there may be some people watching that have never thought about this before they, they own a farm they have employees but they've never really put that pin in what their culture is how would someone that runs a farm know what their culture is to begin with michael um, well, it's a wonderful conversation to have, especially now. It's the holiday season. This is the time when uh, every, you know, we, the the importance of gathering family, you know, our atmosphere, what's it like? Traditions are obvious right now. Anchors, what I call anchors in our families are very, are very uh, obvious. You know, the things that we do because this is the way we do it. And that's how you can tell it's actually, your actual, your specific efforts are having impact because you'll hear people talk about, well, well, here, this is the way we do it. Whether it's 
traditions like, you know, uh, holiday gatherings, holiday parties, the way we decorate, the way we hold our meetings, the way you're expected to contribute at certain meetings when we set it up ahead of time. You know, um, my behavior has been not only told to me, but I've been held accountable for it over time that it becomes the way we do it. And now more important than ever before, bring those conversations up if you've never done it. If you've never had a conversation of, of with your employees, this is the time to do it. What's it like working here? What what, what would you like to see change? What what to, what can we add that would make a new tradition that uh, I'm willing? You know, let's let's play a little bit, and and watch where the conversations go. Because believe it or not, there are things that they're doing and saying that if you were aware of, you would go. I didn't even know we did that. I didn't even know I did that. But our reputation over time has been built, which I call anchors and traditions, that you keep the good ones and you change the ones that are having a negative impact. But ask your people. It's a great conversation. Mark, have you had that conversation? Have you had your employees uh, kind of guide where your culture goes? Not intentionally, but yes, we have. And I say not intentionally. We've had some conversations. We have a growth coach that is helping our farm in our, in our growth phase. And uh, and we've had conversations about, you know, what it is we believe, what it is we do, that we do well, what it is we need to throw out the door or, or revise before we throw it out the door. So we've had some conversations like that. But but we need to have more of those conversations like Michael mentioned. Well, call it a stay interview, so to speak, but really that stay interview can can kind of evolve into that that culture piece because we all have a culture. You have a culture in your household, so do I. Farm Bureau has a culture. Rough Farms has a culture. Ignite Performance has a culture. You know, so so what is that culture? And then what's good about it? What's bad about it? What do we need to change or add to? We've got a great question here, and I, I want to pose it to Michael first about leadership styles. Are there specific leadership styles that work best for fostering a positive farm employee culture? And Michael, I, I asked this uh, when I saw this question pop up because I have had leaders throughout my career uh, that I, I would not consider leaders. It was just because of their title that they were they were leaders. Uh, and then I've had leaders that have uh, done exactly what you two are talking about in order to guide uh, people that are following them in the right direction. And we all kind of row in that boat uh, at the same time. So are there specific leadership styles that work best in a culture? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and just like anything else, we all have a style. We all have a personality and there are different types of personalities. I have four children. They're all grown and they've got kids of their own now, married and got kids of their own. And I will tell you, you know, raising those kids, they were four completely different people. And so I and my wife had to go out of our way to adjust depending on the person. My first daughter was 32 when she was born. I mean, her first words were, I'll do it myself. You know, so being aware of uh, and my my third daughter, we had three girls and a boy. My third daughter was last in the pool in everything. We just had a different approach. And then my one son, if he survived till adulthood, adulthood, he'd be the catch of the century. We knew it. Uh, and he is. He's, he's a great guy. But he had four mothers. So dealing with all of the, the different personality types takes effort on my part. So a leadership style, uh, no matter what your personality type is, can always be added to the way that you do things. Because, you know, we all have different approaches. We all have different styles. But the fact is, if I took the title away from your name, would they still follow you is a great thing for you to ask yourself when it comes to your leadership abilities. And that's that's really what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, Stephen Covey said something brilliant. You know, he said, you know, a leader is not the, the, the ace player. Matter of fact, you're better than your best player because you manage 10 best players. So you don't just create one unit uh, an hour like your best team. You create 10 because you're getting things done with and through others. And with that little mentality, the concept of leader is your number one job is to grow and develop people. I work with farms a lot where they're expanding. We're adding 600 head of cattle. And they're, they're, if your first reaction is, I don't have enough time in the day to take this on. I don't know if I can do it. Then, you're, then you are not in a leadership position. Because if you're going to add 600 head of cattle, it's got to be more than you. So who else needs to have skill sets added to their bag? And, and so you rise to a management issue as opposed to the doing part of it. And that's a hard transition for people, especially in the farming world, because you've been the ones, you know, with your hands in the dirt your whole life. 
And it's a different transition as you grow. So those are just some elements that when it comes to personality styles, yes, everybody's got a different style, but leadership tactics and techniques can always be added no matter what your style is. Mark, you and I know a lot of farmers across the state, and one of the hardest things for them to do is delegate. Talk about how you're able to do that on the farm and maybe give us an insight about your leadership style. Sure. Well, it is, it is key, you know, and when we started, you know, it was, it was Marsha and I, right? I mean, it, you were doing everything, everything you were doing yourself, you know, so you were focused on that. But when you really step back and realize that if I want to grow, if I want to be able to do other things in my world, in my life, then I need to find somebody else that can work next to me, beside me, in place of me, preferably down the road. So how do I do that? And one of my longest term employees, I mean, he, we were, we, he was my first I say professional full-time employee that I would say I have. He's with us today. He's left for a while. He's come back. Um, and, you know, so so kind of enabling him to, to do that work. And now he's honestly my best proponent of our culture. He really is the one that says, no, we won't, or yes, we will. I mean, he understands that he has seen this place rise, and he is not willing to see it fall, and will will die on the hill you know, protecting what we have. And so, you know, he's, he's really be kind of come that leader because of the delegation that I've given. And it's hard because when you delegate, then you're giving trust to others and you're giving them responsibility for that end outcome. And you're working with landowners and how are they going to relate with that landowner? How are they going to interact with that landowner? Or is the job going to be done right? Will the fertilizer be spread correctly? Will the machine be checked out thoroughly? You know, how do we make sure that we don't have a critical failure? So wow, wow you really have to have that level of trust to be able to delegate. So if you don't, if you can't trust others and trust yourself to teach others to work in place of you, then the delegation is going to be impossible. It is, will be absolutely impossible. From a leadership yeah. style myself, you know, I, I think it evolves and I think it changes based on the individual. Terry in my office uses a pretty good analogy. You know, Mark, you have, let's say 10 employees. It's like having 10 horses in the barn. You have the racehorse in this corner who needs a totally different rash and needs treated totally different than that workhorse, that draft horse over here. And then you have the trail horse who needs something totally different. Yeah, doesn't really need a lot, but you know, and strong and steady and maybe slow, get the job done. And uh, so how do you adjust your leadership style based upon that horse in the stall and what they need is critical. Uh, so it's really stepping back to identify what are the pros, cons, the assets and attributes that I have to work with and how do I adjust myself? Because kind of like teaching in a classroom, every student's a little different. You, you have to approach them a little differently. Every employee is the same way. Michael, that's good stuff. You might steal that, won't you? I'm stealing all of it. And let me just <laughs> let me just say, Mark, you know, Mark, one of the things that you I really want to emphasize because I want people to really hear this is that's the benefit of a good culture. When somebody when you when you hear the words confidence and competence and and the way that sounds is that they take ownership for how things are spread they take ownership for fixing the making sure their equipment is working right and clean properly they're the ones who own it as much as you that is the result of trust and trust has to be built you don't hire for competence and competence you hire for skill sets, but the confidence in my job is built over time. The, the competence in my job, the application of my skill sets that I brought in how it's done here is all an element of culture. And you hear it screaming through Mark because those he's got people that own their positions as much as he does. That's success, man. And that's the result of culture approached on purpose. You know, it's good stuff. Great. Great conversation. Michael Hoffman is founder and owner of Igniting Performance Incorporated, Mark Ruff with Ruff Farms in Pickaway County. I really appreciate your expertise on this topic and appreciate your time on being the webinar on the webinar today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Todd. So it's always a pleasure. You know, we're in the back pocket of, of you guys. Anything you guys need, continue to use the resource of Farm Bureau. They're just the best, Ohio. You guys are doing such a great job. We appreciate you. Thank you both very much. The Labor Intelligence Report I mentioned earlier, online now at ohiofarmbureau.org, all part of the resources we have on farm labor through Ohio Farm Bureau. It's titled, Where Are They? Farm Employees, Strategies, and Solutions for Your Farm, and then exclusively for Ohio Farm Bureau members, a guide to finding, hiring, and retaining farm employees. This is webinar number four and the last of a series. You can get caught up on the other three webinars online as well at ohiofarmbureau.org. Have a great rest of the day and thanks for watching. I'm Ty Higgins. See you down the road. Thank you. Bye guys.